It is an honor and an absolute pleasure to have Chris Smalls with us now for an interview. Chris Smalls is the president of the Amazon Labor Union. And he not only represents workers who are fighting for better working conditions, better pay. He really represents a modern day David and Goliath story that I think inspires a lot of people. So Chris, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us. Thank you, thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you broke a little bit of news on Hassan Piker's Twitch stream today because you talked about uh, basically building up to a general strike in 2024. And I have to ask you about that right off the bat because it's definitely exciting to hear that. Uh, At the same time, obviously it takes a lot of work to get to that point. Um, So tell us about it. Uh, What are you planning? What can people do to pitch in and help? Yeah, definitely. I've been on tour across the country. It's been like a real hot labor summer. And um, you know, we been uh, spreading the same message, you know, that uh, there's a time uh, in this country right now where uh, labor is really on the uprise. And uh, and the only, and only way we're gonna get our demands met is by withholding our labor. So I've been spreading that gym pretty much as I've been traveling. And uh, you know, I just think by 2024, every union in this country should be strike ready, uh, regardless because of the things that's going on. You know, abortion rights, gun laws, uh, the tragedies, police brutality, social injustice, environmental, the list goes on and on every day. And, you know, I think just for me, uh, being the current president of the Amazon Labor Union, I know that the company is not going to recognize us. Uh, same thing with Starbucks. They're not going to get recognized. Mm-hmm. So the only thing we can do is build and build until we're able to strike. You know, when you look at the lack of representation for workers through congressional legislation, It's just so clear that the only time workers really made gains in this country was the pressure that they implemented through organized labor in the lead up to the New Deal, which wasn't perfect. There were certainly people left behind in the New Deal. But at the end of the day, it's not like, you know, Roosevelt decided out of the goodness of his heart to push for economic programs that bettered people's lives. There was a lot of pressure from organized labor. Some of those strikes got violent as a result of the response from authorities to those strikes. But they fought and they made some significant gains. And I think what we've seen from the press in the last several decades was just kind of like this like intentional forgetfulness about how this country came to have like a golden era. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, oh, all you need to do is vote. That's all you need to do. do. Electoral politics is all that matters. Um, but I think a lot of Americans are starting to wake up to the fact that only focusing on electoral politics has limited, you know, pays li- limited dividends essentially, yeah. right? So, can you talk about the kind of reception you've received from members of Congress in regard to your efforts to organize labor? Yeah, I mean, well, that's always a a tough conversation because you know we have to force them to do their jobs, and um, you know it wasn't until we were victorious that we got any type of support. So uh, to have it now, you know, visiting the White House, uh, having a comrade and Bernie Sanders, um, that's all good. But I know that's not enough. You know, I know we still have to organize regardless of, of what happens. You know, we're not going to rely on them. Um, to give us what we want, you know, we're not going to get the Pro Act passed. Um, we can't even get, you know, uh, certain protections right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the administration still has to fund the NLRB to help our situations out when it comes to these petitions that are being filed, um, the unfair labor practices that these com- uh, corporations break every day. Um, it's still a, a long way to go. So for us. Um, that's on the ground, we have to continue to organize and push these politicians in the direction that we need to. If not, um, we need to get them out you know, and replace them. 100%. You know, what I appreciated about your handling of members of Congress is how, you know, you don't get rowdy or loud or angry, but you use words that cut. And you recently, well, fairly recently testified before the Senate Banking Committee 
And there was a moment where you specifically addressed Lindsey Graham. And I love that moment because what you said was so powerful and you say, you didn't have to get, you know, aggressive about it. You just calmly stated something that was just so true and resonated with so many workers. I want to show a quick clip of that moment and then we'll discuss it. Let's watch. I want to address Mr. Graham. Um, first off, you know, you're, it sounded like you was talking about more of the companies and the businesses and your speech, but you forgot that the people are the ones who make this, these companies operate. And if we're not protected, and if the process for when we hold these companies accountable is not working for us, then that's not what, that's the reason why we're here today. That's the reason why I'm here to represent the workers who make these companies go. And I think that it's in your best interest to realize that it's not a, a left or right thing. It's not a Democrat or a Republican thing. It's a workers thing. God, I love that moment, especially with uh, Senator Graham kind of like looking down and sh you know he was embarrassed. Like, because you're calling him out on something that I think most people in this country, whether they identify as Democrats or Republicans, you know, can understand and feel <laughs> because they're dealing with these working conditions and low pay themselves, yeah. right? So to call them out specifically on their BS and their lack of representation for the ordinary working man, I think is incredible. And I just like hearing Lindsey Graham's name, I, I get like, I can feel my heart rate go up. I get like <laughs> the anger start to like, you know, yeah, build inside me, you know, but you, you handled it so well. I definitely went off script. I had to hold it in. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a fact, you know, um, they're playing politics with our lives. And this is not about that, this is a life or death situation that we're in. And, you know, they forgot that I'm not a politician. They didn't do a thorough background check. <laughs> I was protesting outside the White House, you know, all last year. And, um, you know, I had to remind them that you have workers in the room today. So the disrespect ain't gonna go but so far. You know, there was uh, this attempt to paint you as like someone who doesn't, is not well equipped to succeed the way that you did. You know, there was that leaked memo from Amazon that clearly Jeff Bezos had to have signed off on that, indicating that it's a good thing that you're the face of this organizing effort because uh, you're not, I don't remember the exact wording, but I believe they said that you're not articulate. Yeah. And it turns out that you show them you're, you're, pre, you're not only plenty articulate, but you know how to get people together and, and organize and actually succeed in unionizing literally the top employer in the country, Amazon, one of the most powerful corporations in this country. And so, you know, what I'm curious about is what kind of intimidation tactics did you yourself experience from Amazon once they realized, oh no, he's actually a threat here? Yeah, um, they didn't waste any time. You know, with within our second week of our campaign, they um, they already had you know a, a team of union busters uh, flown in. Um, we seen them walking around the building. They're being paid ten thousand, uh, ten thousand dollars a day. Some of them. Um, they started to put the workers in captive audiences. Um, that started months ago. I think we we found out after the court hearing was over, uh, that they put them in over 3,300 captive audiences. So we had to overcome that. Um, they built a barbed wire fence. They called the fire department on us several times. They called the NYPD on us. I was arrested myself. Um, other members were arrested that were actual Amazon workers, uh, causing intimidation, you know, uh, trying to create fear and doubt. Uh, we dealt with that. And just uh, the, the the demonizing of my character, um, trying to smear me, mm -hmm. trying to smear other leaders, um, they use that as well, you know. So um, it's really amazing that when I think about it, you know, the odds that we had to defeat, you know, on top of the four point three million dollars. Right, and and wasn't there some ridiculous campaign to try to smear you as someone who's gonna like pocket the dues that the union would pay to like buy yourself fancy cars? I mean, just yeah. gross, <laughs> gross smears, insane. Uh, they'd come after you if you were uh, delivering food to Amazon workers and things like that. Um, 
Now going back to a little of what you said in your testimony before that Senate committee, you know, you said specifically this isn't a Democrat or Republican thing, and I think workers feel that. But it's difficult in this political era to get people to work together when your political tribe is usually front and center in your identity, right? So how do you get workers to organize knowing that there might be some disagreements among them on issues not related to their working environment, just issues related to other political policies? Well, we, we try to stay clear of that, you know. Um, the reason why we're an independent union is because we don't want to get tied to politics because we're representing 8,300 members that we know are going to have different political views. Um, so we always keep the conversation based on work related issues to build off of that commonality. You know, everybody has some grievances that they want to change within their workplace. So we try to build conversations off of that um, and not excluding whether you're a Trump supporter or whether you're Biden or whoever. Mm -hmm. um, we just want to make sure that we're taking care of one another when it comes to just basic you know, human rights and having a better quality of life. Um, and I just think that uh, as union leaders in this country that we have a responsibility as well to get involved in other uh, demonstrations and other industries as well. Um, we have to make sure that we're speaking up when it comes to women's rights, speak up when it comes to environmental social injustice because labor is the most powerful asset that we have as the working class. You know, we all, that's the only way we can come together is by withholding our labor um, on things that we all wanna fight for. What I love about what you're doing is it just makes it so clear that there is no profit without the worker. You know, for so long, especially with the help of the corporate press, the thought process is no, I mean, it's the incredible geniuses at the top. You know, it's the board members and it's the executives who are the, the ones that matter. And the, you know, the workers are just kind of on the back burner. No one's really thinking about them. But really, when it comes to the day to day, when it comes to generating that revenue, it's the people who are being mistreated by the executives and the board members. And I think it's what we're seeing with this momentum with labor is this realization among ordinary Americans in general that like, oh yeah, that's right. I mean, we're looking at these incredibly successful companies, many of which don't even pay a dime in federal taxes. And the profits that they're making don't just come out of nowhere. It comes from those Amazon delivery drivers who are doing those brutal delivery routes with no breaks and they have to defecate in plastic bags, you know? Which reminds me, you know, you, didn't quit Amazon, you were forced out, you were fired in 2020 after you made a simple request, which is, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we don't feel safe, we need PPE, we need safety, we need security, we don't wanna get sick. And then when your calls for PPE went unanswered, you know, you organized a, a, a walkout and then you got fired for that. Yeah. And. Um, Talk about what the working conditions were like, because you have admitted, you know, out of all those jobs that you've worked, um, Amazon was competitive with wages, right? But uh, the way that they treat their workers seems um, pretty gross. Yeah, no, yeah, we had a. Uh, if you had the gym membership, I told you to to quit because you're doing ten to twelve hours of calisthenics. Um, Jesus, uh, the buildings are massive. For example, JFK. A million square feet, 14 NFL football fields. Um, you walk laps, you know, 30 to 60 miles sometimes, the state of Rhode Island. Jesus. And a 10 hour shift. And, you know, there's uh, the injuries, of course. Uh, they hire any, anywhere between, you know, 18 to senior citizens. And um, they try to get the senior citizens to work as fast as somebody who's in their young 20s or 18. Um, that never is going to pan out the right way. So, um, I used to see people get injured all the time, um, not last very long. And um, there's also been reports just a few days ago in Albany, uh, heat exhaustion. Um, this case is in New Jersey, a, a worker just died on Prime Day. Um, these things are real stories, you know, real lives. And um, that's the reason why we had to take further action. Let's get back to the general strike, because again, that is, <sighs> If anyone else was pushing for that to happen in 2024, I might roll my eyes. But you've, 
proven yourself to be so effective at organizing workers and I wouldn't doubt you in a, for a second. <laughs> okay, so but but talk to me about what the strategy is and and we have a super active audience. If there's any way they can help, I'm sure they'd want to. So what's the what's the strategy? What's the plan? Well, yeah, we have to sometimes we have to hold unions accountable too. You know, I'm only one aspect of the labor movement, um, but to be a movement, we all have to move together. So, um, you know, I've been traveling the country. I've been um, multiple cities, multiple union conventions, uh, spreading the same message. Um, so we're starting to reach the labor, um, the labor world, but we have to expand that. So now, just uh, having that conversation, starting at home, your own family members, little things, uh, canceling their prime, mm -hmm. uh, showing up for Starbucks workers, ordering their drink, Union Strong, um, showing up for the Strippers United, who's been on strike right here in California, uh, showing up for Starbucks workers that are striking all over the country, uh, donating to our funds. Um, those are the little things that we can start to get uh, workers prepared to withhold their labor. And we're asking unions um, that have strike funds uh, to make sure that those uh, strike funds are being used, not just uh, collected. You know, yeah. So we have to prepare ourselves uh, little by little. But over time, I think um, we'll be able to get to a point where we can be on the same accord. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up those strike funds because there was a report published this week that was pretty damning of some unions and how you know they'll collect the dues and they've got the money. Uh, but it doesn't seem like they're using it to their advantage. I'm gonna read a few uh, graphics here uh, about this report. So in 2020, for instance, organized labor had $35.8 billion in assets and $6.8 billion in liabilities, leaving approximately $291 billion in net assets, assets minus liabilities, of course. Over a third of labor's assets are highly liquid with $13.5 billion held in cash or treasury securities, and the remainder in investments and fixed assets like real estate. Um, but at the same time, since 2010, union density has declined from almost 12% to just over 10%. And there are more than 700,000 fewer union members as an absolute number. And according to the Census Bureau, organized labor employs 23,440 fewer employees in 2020 compared to 2010, a 19% decline in the workforce. So the point here is they've got a lot of money. They've got the ability to do more organizing. They have the resources to fight for more unionization in, in various stores and, and warehouses across the country. Doesn't seem like they're using it. And so I, I think you're right when you mention, hey, you know, it's time to use your strike funds, time to you know provide the protection the workers need if we do follow through with a, a general strike. What kind of pressure can be applied to union leaders to make that happen? That's up to you know myself and other um, you know up and coming uh, union leaders in the movement. Um, you know we have to either hold our comrades accountable as well. And we have to make sure that leadership is uh, is on board. That the fact that this is uh, the new school style of organizing, you know, we're not afraid. We're not, you know, hiding in secrecy. We're outspoken. We're out front. We're at the doorsteps of these billionaires, and we we want to be. Um, we want to have that that camaraderie. We want to have our our people and our coworkers behind us um, in militancy, and we want to make sure that they're secured. And if they can provide the resources, there's no need to hold withhold that. You know, we're ready to go. And I think that um, you know, just a lot of leadership that's just you know, once again playing the political way. Uh, they have to wait for certain things. They have to wait for this um, this politician or they're endorsing this candidate. Mm -hmm. And we can't get caught up in that. You know, we don't have that time to wait. You know, every day that we're not doing something, the other side is winning, and, and that's. The point that I'm trying to make with uh, calling for a general strike. I love it. Uh, where can our viewers donate if they want to support your efforts? I don't want on our website at AmazonLaborUnion.org, uh, Twitter as well at Amazon Labor. Um, follow us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram at Amazon Labor Union. Chris, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, hope you enjoy your time in LA, and I hope you come back on the show. Really, oh, yeah. really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me.